Hi, uh, good evening and uh, welcome to our December edition of the e.m.i. That's the webinar on the economy, the markets and uh, investment portfolio. And I thought that for this month in December, uh, we will focus on the sectors uh, uh, in terms of the economy and as well as the markets. So to that extent, we will today not uh, focus too much on the global economy. Uh, and uh, let's look inwards because global sectors, there are a few sectors which are global like cyclicals, but those I think will get covered as we speak, right? So to start off with, right, let's look at it from an economy perspective. I think it's worthwhile looking at it from the lockdown perspective, because I think the critical element here is that I put up this slide before, right? we had 17 weeks of the lockdown, right? In the 17 weeks, right, all countries, in week three to week nine, went through a very severe lockdown and then gradually started easing. So it is this first set of countries and the next set, right? In both, you can see that the red has started becoming yellow. The reason I point out this is that world over, right? You're seeing that economies are beginning to ease the lockdown. Some have come to as low as two. India itself is at two and a half, right? So the reason I'm saying is that from an economy sector point of view, this is very critical because the countries which did the most severe lockdown saw the greatest contraction in the GDP. And India, with a ranking you can see there in the middle, it's 10, right? For four weeks, we had at 10. And no other country had got to that extent. Uh, Italy was at 9.5. Even in this slide, if you see, Spain was at 9.5 for two weeks. Nobody else went to 10. So the most severe lockdown caused the most severe contraction in the GDP, right? So please understand that whatever 24% negative GDP growth we saw in Q1 of this fiscal was a direct result not of the COVID crisis, but of the lockdown, the severity of the lockdown. And you can naturally see that in a lockdown, what gets affected was it's the services sector, right? And the manufacturing sector because employees couldn't go to work. So supply side constraints came and services, people couldn't go to malls, people couldn't go to movie theaters, couldn't go to anywhere, right? So that lockdown, the purpose of it was control of the coronavirus epidemic. So there, if you see India's severe lockdown, economic matters will come to later. The infection curve, because of the severity of the lockdown, the infection curve has started coming down. So we peaked somewhere in September. So the impact of the lockdown was felt and then we started easing up. So that's where you see that the infection started rising when we eased up the lockdown. But now with some degree of herd immunity building up, though there was a scare in the middle of November, we have now eased. And you see that both the daily new cases, both in terms of seven day moving average as well as absolute line have come down. So the lockdown was worth it as a country because the country's people have been protected and hence future growth rebound can happen that much faster. Not only is that, it's also the recovery rate. So there was a lot of worry about India's medical, the way we can treat the crisis and what we can do. I think we have come out well because both the fatality rate, which is the black line and the recovery rate have shown strong improvement. So I think that the pessimism which everybody had in April, May, June, because of the lockdown and everything was looking bad, made the fact that domestic economy related indices corrected sharply, right? But this recovery means that the bounce back is also occurring sharply. So this is a very important fundamental factor to keep note of and that lockdown effect and the release of the lockdown effect is clearly seen in the unemployment statistic. So whether it's rural or urban, unemployment shot up in the lockdown period. People couldn't go to work. Migrant laborers went back to their villages and hence there was a sharp crunch. But the government eased it by increasing the Narega payout in the rural areas. So rural employment came back, you can see, faster than urban. But now, as you can see, people have started re-migrating back to the urban areas. So unemployment levels are back again at pre-COVID level, right? So I'm trying to correlate it to your lockdown. So when these migrants come back, so two things, right? What did the migrants do when they went back to their villages? 
And what are the migrants going to do when they come back to here and get employment and get income, right? So that sets the base for our discussion. So the first signs of normalization is GST. I think that's a very good number to look at because today with one India, one rate, the activity level directly the government is creaming off the service tax, right? So the generalized service tax is being creamed off. So as you can see, activity level improve, the GST level has improved. So biggest sign of confidence for a rebound in the economy is the GST collection. And you look at it, it's actually not uniform. While India has shown a bounce back to back to one lakh crore collection monthly, you can see that within the states, Rajasthan, Odisha, Haryana are all at 20% growth in GST collections, right? Whereas Karnataka, Maharashtra, Telangana are in the single digit. Overall, India's average is about 11%. So why I'm pointing this out is when these Maharashtra, Telangana also come back, you can see that GST numbers will actually go well past this 1 lakh, maybe to a lakh and 20, lakh and 30 in the coming months. A clear signs of the V-shaped recovery happening. Right? And people's mobility is being seen from the electronic toll collection and the highways, shop fall during the lockdown and then a rise, right? Then e-way bill generation, the government purchasing. As you know, intrastate, interstate, governments only do. So you can clearly see from the V-shape, two things. One is the V-shape. The second is it's now gone well above the baseline of zero into positive territory, right? Again, a very good uh, indicator of the recovery occurring. And more importantly, freight, because freight ultimately tells you about economic activity. The big bulk uh, commodities moving, cement, the first graph, steel, the second graph, coal, the third graph, fertilizer, the fourth graph. These are the huge bulk commodities. And you can see everywhere there is a V-shaped recovery. And so overall total freight is also showing. Exact numbers are given there for November month. You can see that there's a 109% pickup in the train freight compared to November. And cement has grown very fast at 126, steel at 120, fertilizer at 112, and coal at 99. So you can see there's a correlation story happening. One around fertilizers, the second around cement, steel, and coal, right? We'll come to that in a bit, right? So naturally, on the back of this coal, movement is electricity consumption is going up steadily right and overall these people in the lockdown and afterwards have got now addicted to television watching right so fundamentally can you see that the v-shaped recovery is strongly seen in the tv ads index right so that's good news for all brands which advertise on television they get very good viewership right and to summarize in terms of sectors exports Two-wheeler sales, power demand, GST collections we already saw, passenger vehicle demand, and rail freights. These are the sectors clearly showing a V-shaped recovery, right? And hence, the economy has three sectors, right? There's manufacturing, there's services, there's agriculture. So both the manufacturing and services, there was a deep contraction, the V, right? Services contracted far higher than manufacturing, as you can see from the blue line. Right? Because in a lockdown, complete service industry came to a halt. But now in the recovery, while manufacturing recovered first, services has caught up very, very rapidly. Right? And it's now both are at 50 plus and inching close to each other. So the core manufacturing and services sectors have shown. But on the third sector, agriculture, right? agriculture didn't go through a V at all. Agriculture, on the contrary, has been rising. What is the reason? There was a good rubby crop harvest. So farmers had money. Two, the outlook for the monsoon came very early, very positive. So farmers had confidence to sow. And the three, what is the next factor? The third factor was the fact that the migrant labor who moved from urban to rural provided plenty of labor for sowing. So Kharif sowing has seen a week on week increase. And in fact, as of comparing the same month last year to previous year, you are now at a seven year high on Kharif sowing. So the effect of this will be seen in the Kharif harvest, which should start very shortly. In the south, it's uh, Pongal. In the north, it's uh, Baisakhi, Shankranti. This is the harvest season, right? So the Kharif harvest will give and the, already the first signs of this are being seen in today's inflation print, 
which came down very low because the supply of agricultural commodities should bring down inflation and hence make it very, very convenient from a Reserve Bank outlook perspective also, right? So overall, to summarize it, Jeffrey's character is an economic indicator, which has come down to back to 98% of pre-COVID levels as of third week of last month, right? So clearly the Indian economy, after seeing a massive impact due to the lockdown, has actually now wiped off the COVID impact and come back to pre-COVID. But bear in mind, pre-COVID itself was not great for India. Right from December 2017, we were in a downturn, but it is some saving grace that we are back to pre-COVID. Now we have to chart the next path of growth back to pre-December 17 levels. Right. So from that perspective, you've had a sense of the uh, sectors which are doing well, but let's also look at the fact that in the lockdown, since supply side constraints companies suffered, the government had given through RBI moratoriums, right? First moratorium, second moratorium. So as far as the banking sector is concerned and some of the borrowers, the big worry was what happens when the moratorium comes to an end? First, where are those companies going to suddenly get the money to pay? Or is RBI going to extend a third moratorium and just kicking the problem down the road? Or how do we permanently solve this problem from a longer term perspective? That's where RBI said no third moratorium and we'll put a resolution framework under Mr. Kamath, right? A Kamath committee to sort out saying without a moratorium, what do you do? So what the government did in this exercise was all those who are not already bad loans. See, if somebody is already bad before, you can't take this excuse and bail him out. Okay, so what was a bad loan before continues as a bad loan. But people who are good borrowers just pre-lockdown, for them, RBI and Kamath Committee have given a restructuring proposal by which, if you see, 66% of all rated companies in India are going to benefit. So what is the positive impact of this? First, on the borrowers, right? you find that most of these good quality borrowers who went in trouble were in construction, real estate, and chemicals. And so these are the industries which are going to maximum benefit from the restructuring in terms of not having the pressure to pay all those installments which they did not pay during the moratorium. So big, big economic boost, right? Second is that naturally housing and real estate are going to get a boost, you saw that. But before I move into this, the reason that housing and real estate were well were around because the biggest beneficiary of this RBI framework is the banks. Because while the borrowers have to worry about how they will suddenly pay, the banks have to worry that if the borrower doesn't pay, I'm going sitting on a huge pile of NPAs. So in the post-March market rally, the banks initially did not benefit because there was this worry of the NPA overhang which is going to come and hit them. So the Kamath Committee recommendation actually now eased the burden from the banks. So banks suddenly realized that mentally they had set aside a certain amount of the liquidity that RBI had pumped in. Of the 8 lakh crores of liquidity, 6.5 lakh crores was just for banks. They had kept it aside, parked it in government securities and back in the reverse repo window just because they were worried about how much provision to create. And that's why rate transmission did not happen so fast initially. But banks were scared. Moment this comment committee thing and banks said, ha, I am now relieved. So not only the banks have started to release money, they are now competing for interest rates. And you know that housing loans today are below 7%. Best ever was at 7.17, right? Years ago, it's back below that level. So you have lifetime low housing loans today because banks are flush with money and eager to spread their risk over hundreds of individual borrowers rather than a few companies. Now the companies, what are they doing? They are going directly to the capital market. So commercial paper rates are today at 3%. In some borrowing is taking place below repo rate. Okay, so good quality companies are able to touch the debt capital markets to raise money. And retail individuals are going to benefit from this. And the real estate, of course, states like Maharashtra, cutting stamp duty to record levels have given a big boost. And just to give you a sense, just look at this table. This is done for Mumbai suburbs, right? 
and we have compared from 2007 which is about 13 years ago 2012 2017 current right and we looked at the price per square foot that's been going up for the built up houses the sizes of house we keep at the normal uh, 2 bhk 900 uh, level the cost of a house has naturally gone up because of this loss from 6.3 to 12.2 million that's about uh, you know 10 lakhs is a million right so 1.2 crores if you say and if you take then a loan eligibility of 70% of the house cost this is what you will be eligible but the interest rates have come down from 2007 10% to 7.5% right so the emi that he has to pay effectively comes from 68000 but his annual income from 2007 to now has gone up three times to 2.9 so the increase in income percentage is 8% that is the annual increment that you are given so the emi to income ratio from 51% has dropped to 29% and a property price to income ratio has dropped from 6.3 to 4.2 so houses have never been more affordable from a housing loan finance to purchase element right so i'm sure all of you are also aware of this but you should all if you have not already taken a housing loan this is the right time in terms of the inflection between property prices and interest rates it's a very correct time to buy a house but this housing sector rebound is not only good for the banking sector but it's good for in the long run so initially what will happen initially you will find that second hand houses are the ones which will sell a lot us also we saw the trend here also we saw the trend but once the second hand houses get used up then there will be fresh construction starting and that will have a multiplier effect on seven to eight industries right right from cement to steel to electrical wiring to paints to uh, tiles to plumbing materials to you know you can name it all of it will get a boost right so this now is a second set i said if you not bought a house buy a house but this is even if you bought a house buy a second house because today the benefit of the fact that you can rent it out so what we have done here is we have compared the spread that is the housing loan adjusted for tax benefit versus rental yield so earlier you have to build a 7% cushion between the post tax housing loan rate and the rental yield you will get from the property that has come down to half now to 3% so with only 3% from your money putting in the house is actually paying for itself over a period of time so it's a wonderful asset to create right so this is the way we see that lots of people are now going to buy second houses and third houses purely from an investment perspective so that's going to give a further boost to the housing and the real estate sector which as i just explained has a multiplier effect on the economy right so that's just a clue we'll go deeper into some of this stuff later but now because of this recovery right the 24% negative is a given a 9% negative was expected that has now been come down it has been improved to minus 7.5 and so we think that the next quarter will be 2.7 and the fourth quarter you should get positive 3.2 and as you can see that when you go forward the base year effect will be clearly seen in the next quarter because this was a very bad quarter one year why or why will see base but overall on an average as you can see we are going to head towards a 10% gdp growth for fy22 so the dream of double digit gdp growth is actually going to happen in the following year that's per our estimates right and what is this being driven by manufacturing construction trade services and investment right it will go deeper so in addition to this uh, housing uh, and real estate which is primarily going to lead the bounce back the longer term structural positive means that uh, this infrastructure development is going to be a more sustainable one why we do we feel first in this atmanirbhar program government focused equally on some demand side support in terms of uh, loans to corporates and everything 
but more importantly they also did structural reforms to ease up the supply side apmc reforms currently the hot news essential commodities act commercial coal mining defense production through higher fdi power in the union territories they have privatized the discoms public sector they have opened up only strategic sectors will they limit to the private sector and rbi framework we just spoke about so as a result of this crisis from the coming budget perspective we believe that the government has managed it prudently and increasingly our focus should be on the budget so first thing is we don't expect india to have any meaningful downgrade because of the way we are managed what is it we didn't do too much on the demand side in terms of note printing we did in fact structural reforms and by managing that well we have managed to keep our rating above investment grade which is very critical for foreign investment to come in which is what structural reforms are meant to achieve so the tax rate cut which was done last year is a big positive for india from 35% we halved our tax rate to 17% next is that our ease of doing business rankings have improved steadily now we are 79 ranks better than 5 years ago so that again is a huge jump and a positive for india and we all know the china plus one strategy because the covid in addition to the tariff related wars with china has made people say that i should not depend only on china as my manufacturing source so i need china plus one in that plus one is where india's all these steps will come and contribute which is clearly seen in some surveys done about people who are already based in china who are saying that i want to set up new facilities outside china and the main reason is structurally china has a declining population as compared to india's rising population so for the next 30 years india's got a solid labor supply market available for any foreign manufacturer to look at so we believe that over the next 3 to years the very next year it may not happen but over the next 3 to 5 years you are going to see this fdi driven indian manufacturing sector is definitely going to get a boost because of these enabling factors right so now from that economic underpinning that we have stated right we will now move to the markets and what they are telling us because as you know the stock markets are a lead indicator of the economic future so what the markets are telling you today is what the markets think will happen tomorrow so that market view is also a key to making the case for which sector to invest in so first of all nifty earnings the v shape you can see yes the sharp drop in the june quarter and then you can see the right we'll look at the numbers later but basically what's happened with the v shaped recovery is that we are now saying that we will move from a 450 to 490 kind of a nifty eps to very next year the double digit gdp growth i talked about is going to imply that a nifty eps for fy 21 22 is going to be 677 right so this you get a clue as to why fii money is coming into india one clue here is the projected economic recovery is going to translate into a huge jump in nifty eps expectations right just a minute right so overall if you look at the second quarter's earnings right so you can see here though the gdp growth negative resulted in a negative sales growth that is top line companies were able to cut costs in the downturn the crude crude prices also helped them so ebitda actually grew 14% yoy for the stock market and profit after tax grew 19% yoy why we are saying this is ultimately even the small cap and the micro cap part of the stock market are still the organized sector of the country so what this tells you is that while the overall demand collapse and the lockdown affected the sales these people were able to pass on the burden to the unorganized sector and improve their profitability significantly that's the overall market if you now look at it as large cap mid cap small cap we've roughly line lined also with sebi's definition you can see there that actually the mid caps and the small caps has seem to have shown a sharper earnings growth but caution 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 what when you take away the banks that comes down to single digit profit growth so clearly 
whether it is in large cap mid cap or small caps it is a banking sector which has enjoyed the easy liquidity of rbi so their borrowing costs came down they dropped your savings bank rates they dropped your fixed deposit rates at the same time they didn't drop the lending rates and so their profit margins are huge they wanted to provide a provision for potential npa didn't need that they wrote back those provisions so you can see that the banks are the ones who have contributed to the jump but even otherwise even without the bank jump there is still a positive profit growth despite a negative sales growth so the economic impact is seen in the sales but the company's smart way of managing that downturn by passing on the costs right has clearly seen in the growth in the ebitda and in the profit after tax between ebitda and profit after tax there is a lower interest cost which the stock market companies have been able to get from their banks so clearly the stock market companies are the cream of the industry in india and they are able to not only reduce their interest cost but also their import crude costs and they have been able to pass on the whatever the pressure of the situation to their small scale suppliers and their customers right so as a result of this earning story you can see that all the three indices nifty all of them have now started bouncing back after the march fall but if you look at it from a long term average perspective they are all trading within one or two standard deviation of the long term average so the markets do not appear expensive on a broad base right so if you now however look at it from the perspective of what was the lifetime high the lifetime high was achieved in december 17 right nifty was at 18 pe mid cap was at 24 pe small cap at 20 pe today current levels of pe are given there so what is the change nifty pe has gone up from the lifetime high to 25.5 can you see there the eps and the index growth so the pe has expanded by 2.1 from 17.8 to 19.9 so nifty is the one which is looking expensive and trading above its lifetime high whereas the mid cap index from a 24 pe is still only at 17.6 forward pe and small cap from 20 is at 17.2 so both are still well below their lifetime highs reported in december so effectively today when you look at the down table the mid cap index is trading at a 11% discount to the nifty and the small cap at a 13% discount to the nifty so in a way what this is also telling you the same data to look at in another way is that the mid and small caps still while the recently there has been a rally they have still not achieved the high and hence from that point small cap index is still delivered a minus 30% and mid cap are delivered a minus 8% whereas large cap has delivered a plus 20% right so this recent rally has only partly covered the gap in mid cap and small cap there's still a long way to go right and so if you now look at it right that recent rally so you can look at it the one month return a large cap is only single digit whereas the mid cap and the small cap are at double digit take the three months is more or less similar so what has happened in the last one month you are seeing there's a big shift towards mid and small cap because what the valuation gap is very available very easily discernible but more importantly they feel the economic recovery is becoming back on track and hence mid and small caps are expected to also form so the market is reading into that otherwise three months and six months both the indices have been roughly the same even in fact one year because in the post march bounce back there was a catch up again which happened but over a three year period large caps are still outperform the mid cap and the small cap index right so that's the cap curve story right and this tells you that from a large cap perspective that the reason for the catch up happening was that interest rates coming down low meant the bar for equity was low so if you see this is the reverse of the p ratio which is called the earnings yield so when the yield gap between gsec and nifty earnings yield narrows down market always bounces back right so essentially the same factor if you look at it from a phase 
we believe that from a phase one, phase two, phase three, phase four, phase four is the downturn phase. When December 17 peak, we came down to March. Now, many people have different views earlier in terms of whether the March, the new bounce back means that the recovery has started in the economy. The economic green shoots are visible. Hence, we have started now showing this phase five as a bounce back phase, right? And as this sustains. So in the bounce back, what I want to point out here is that normally in a bull cycle, which is what we believe it has started, the mid and small cap outperform the large cap. You can see, right? Phase one was a bull phase. Phase three was a bull phase, right? Now phase five is also a bull phase, but you can see that all the three indices have delivered very similar 70, 74, 90% returns. So truly for this to be a bull phase, mid and small cap has to start outperforming. So if the economic recovery plays out, you'll see that the mid and small cap will bound back far, far faster than the large cap, but that economic return has to be sustained, which you have to wait and watch because we are only talking about six to eight months of data right now from March to November. So observing this over the next few months will give you a clearer pattern on how soon mid and small caps are going to outperform the large caps, right? So the reason that the large caps are performing as good as mid and small cap in this bull phase and have done much better in the down phase. If you see the previous one here, you can see that in the down phase, large caps were also down 24%, but mid and small caps are down 50%, right? What has protected the large caps is FII flows. And to look at that, first look at the fact that globally, interest rates are at a lifetime low, well below the rates, 100 basis points below the global financial uh, crisis rates. Can you see that? Yes. Second is the massive pump of liquidity. Again, comparing it to August 8, it's three times the liquidity. So compared to the previous crisis, lots more money and lot cheaper money has been pumped in, which naturally leaks and finds its way to various markets, right? So in India, if you see, FIA flows have been consistently going. And if you want to compare it with other countries, Korea, Taiwan, Indonesia, Philippines, and Thailand, you can clearly see in the line which says CYTD, that is calendar year to date, and FYTD, financial year to date. What I'm saying is India is the only country which has got positive flows right through. You know, actually January to March, it was also negative. But subsequent positive has been so strong that it's made the calendar itself positive. So January to March, COVID crisis, everybody pulled out money from every emerging market. But after that, India's bounce back, financial year, $24 billion has come in, whereas every other emerging market is still seeing outflow of FII money. So clear reflection of the fact that, what is it? Four things to summarize about India. First, foreigners recognize that India's negative GDP growth was because of our lockdown. The severity of the lockdown caused it. It was not something wrong with India. Second, because of the severe lockdown, we have now controlled the pandemic much better. So that severity of lockdown has helped a strong bounce back in visibility. Point number two. Point number three, the structural reforms brought in by the government, not only during the crisis, but the tax rate reductions, the ease of doing business, all of that has made the long-term story of India positive, aided by the fact that China is facing severe labor pressure as well as negative public relations pressure because of COVID, and hence India is looking relatively more attractive. The numbers speak for themselves, and this is the reason our large cap, despite a very bad economic period for the last three years, the large caps have held their ground, right? Whereas domestic mutual funds have been selling. So in the same financial year to date, quarter two or calendar year, three, four, FIS have brought in 1.9 lakh crores into our country. But domestic mutual funds have sold 76,000 crores. So why are the mutual fund sellers? A, because as the foreigners are buying large caps, the valuation kept going up. The mutual funds wanted to book the profits. One. Two, net April to now, the industry has faced redemptions pressure. So obviously, fresh money is hard to come by. Only by churning the portfolio can you do. 
And if you churn, then you have to sell small and mid cap to buy large cap. The third is that FIS have been buying very polarized stocks. A few 10 to 15 stocks have responsible for the rally. A mutual fund cannot run such a concentrated portfolio in, because diversification is the mantra of mutual funds. So the moment you have to diversify, when these stocks go up, the 10% stock limits prescribed by SELI comes into play and you have to keep carrying your portfolio and buy something else. But that 10% stock is going up higher and higher. But no choice, right? Mutual funds have to be diversified players. Same thing in a, a different graphical form. Right, And as a result of this, when a foreigner is invested in the last year, you can see they made money or more money in other markets than India. India delivered only 8% return in 2019 to an FII. Right? It's the lowest. Still, they put money this year. And even this year, India has still not delivered the best. Yes, we have not been negative like a Europe or a Brazil. But we are only 7.5% positive return. Most other countries have delivered double-digit returns to FIIs. So India still gets money despite not being the best performing market 2019 and 2020 so far because it's the future which is driving this money. right? And if you look at it, India has always been commanding a premium over the world and the emerging markets. Look at this line. The blue line tells you the premium with the world. The green line tells you the premium with emerging. Always high. Over the last two years from December 17, the premium kept coming down. Count. In March, it hit a rock bottom and FIS then felt India is very cheap and have started buying it back again, right? And this in a scenario where emerging market itself has been underperforming. The right hand side, if you see, MSA emerging market is the lowest. S&P is the best performing, then Europe, then Japanese topics, then India. So even within that, the India, that's why the India is at a premium to the emerging market and India has been a darling of the foreign institutional investor. And this, Bounce back of FIA flows naturally has made our PE ratio on the left hand graph go above the long term average. But the reason foreigners still bet on India is because the price to book ratio, which is on your right hand side, is still below its long term. Now, what's the difference between price to earnings and price to book? Price to earnings is price divided by profit and loss, price to book is price divided by balance sheet. What this means is that India, the lockdown caused the demand to collapse. It means that the fresh capacity, which was already created over the last so many years, became idle. So any bounce back now doesn't need extra depreciation interest cost. So the EPS will rise faster than the sales. You saw that in the quarterly results also, where you saw that the sales had been negative, but the EBITDA and EPS were positive. Price to book value means that foreigners believe that India's bounce back in GDP growth will see a much higher earnings growth from corporate India. This is the large cap index. The same is true of the mid cap index. And the same is true of the small cap index. The so small cap index, the price to book has also risen, but still it's round about the long term average and much cheaper than. So the price to book valuation is the what is driving part of the flows into the Indian market from FIIs, right? So now, right, when you now move to the sectoral part, Given the focus on the large caps, I put out here the large cap sectoral performance. And red means negative. So you can see in the sales, auto is still shown a negative quarterly growth, top line. Construction has shown negative growth. Energy has shown. But these are the top line, which is the impact of the GDP correction. But when you look at the PAT growth and the margin change, you can see large cap companies except for metals, telecom, because of the taxation issue and construction, all others have shown a rapid growth in their EBITDA and PAT and have expanded their margin in this downturn. So the fact that large caps have been able to pass on the costs and the pain to that is clearly, clearly visible. And that's one of the reasons that Foreigners are getting confident. So you can look at the sectoral allocation. We'll look at this a little bit later also. So just to summarize, right? And the earnings, those were the actual earnings growth, right? But the other way to look at earnings, sectoral earnings, is to look at it versus consensus. Because market predicts the future. And a positive surprise over the predictor is what delivers capital appreciation. 
and a negative surprise destroys capital opportunity. So the point is that when you look at it from the various industries and if you see the consensus estimates for next year and the estimates for 2002, what contributed to the upgrade, you can see that financials and exporters and global price takers, which is your metals and others, which take price from the London Metal Exchange, are the ones which are the key drivers of earnings upgrade. And you see, that's where you see that the BFSI space has become a attraction because the expectation on the moratorium continuing and the NPA fear drove down the consensus expectation of earnings. And that's where the positive surprise has helped it, right? So similarly, if you change the change in the Nifty earnings estimate from the month on month, you can see that the earnings beat ratio is 68% so far in this quarter, right? And dwelling now into the number of companies beating the analyst estimates, sector by sector. So this, if you look at deeply, and the second quarter F21 and the first quarter F21, look at the difference in the number of companies which are, and which are those sectors which are doing well. So consumer discretionary, 83% of companies beat the analyst estimate compared to only 58%. So that's doing well. Financials, 61 versus 55. Healthcare, 86 versus 42. And mind you, people who are already had raised those estimates, but the financial, the healthcare was able to beat even those estimates with its performance. Industrials, roughly the same. Materials, doubled from 50% to entire sector has beaten the analyst estimates. Technology, roughly the same, 80 to 78. Uh, commercial services is what has come down. Utilities have also fully reported uh, jumps back and overall coverage you saw that number what 68 percent of the companies have beaten the earnings so this gives you a clue as to which are the earnings sectors which are beating estimates because that's where the positive growth will come because that means more than my expectation these uh, sectors are doing better that gives you a clue as the outperforming sectors of the next few months right and hence now, when you look at the stock market performance in the light of those earnings upgrades, you will get a clue, right? So you see the one month return and the three month returns, which are the short term predictors. So as you can see, bank X up 37% three months, IT only 20%, healthcare 11%, consumer durables 28%, nifty consumption only 12, FMCG only 10. Just wait for me to finish this and I will tell you the story. And then you have the cyclicals, which are at 28, 36, 27, 22. So what can you see here is that money is moving away from safety into risk. Now, banking is the one which is a Jekyll and Hyde because banking was considered safe earlier. Then post-corona pandemic, it became a risky sector. Now, because of that riskiness, now, the so it is the riskiness coming back which is helping the banking. Right, and IT, healthcare, FMCG are all at the low to middle double digit, but you're seeing that cyclical, industrial, and the banking sector are the ones which are posting 25 to 30% appreciation in the last three months. The longer term story tells you that there's a long way to catch up on the cyclical industrial. The short terms bounce back has still not wiped out the three-year negative of the cyclical sectors, right? So the story is just starting. It is the way the economic recovery now pans out, which will decide in the coming quarters whether this will be sustained or not, right? And so when you now come to Sundaram's view, right, what I've shown here is the weightage of the various sectors in the NSE 500 index. So it's a broad market index. And I've sorted it in descending order. So the largest in the NSE 500 is obviously private banks with 19%, followed by IT at 12, and then oil and gas because of one company at 10%, and then you have NBFC in the descending order. And then when you look at the last column or the first column on the left, it's a one month return and the one year returns. So as you can see in the one month, the private banks have jumped 23%, right? So our stance is overweight, which matches the way the market is moving. IT, you saw that in the previous flight also that it was a low in terms of this. So the one month return is only 2%. But 
one year is high because the market was rewarding safety just a few months ago. So we have moved our positioning to neutral there. We are underweight on oil and gas as a sector because oil prices are dropping and the recent market move benefits there. We are underweight on NBFCs. Over the last one year, NBFCs haven't done great. In the last one month, there is a jump back, which honestly, as a fund house, we have not favored. Why? Because we see that the NBFC sector is still in a challenge. But what happened in the last one month is that RBI's banking license, a couple of the big, good quality NBFCs like Bajaj, Twins and all have shot up. So that's the reason for the rise. But overall, as a broader call on the NBFC sector, we are still underweight because we don't see that the smaller NBFCs and the lower medium quality NBFCs are going to be able to easily raise money and lend yet. So right now, our view is underweight. FMCG, a safety sector, we are neutral, and that's how the returns show, comes to auto. Auto, we were overweight last month because we saw that bounce back rally, but now we find that it's now easing up. So we are moved to a neutral position, but we already hold a lot of auto. So not that we are holding position. This is more the view that we are talking about. Pharma also we have moved to neutral because the initial thing on the whole vaccine and the cure and the FMCG, healthcare, everything, I think there's been a very good return over the last one year. But as you can see, the one month return is more of a softer thing. Broader financial services, we continue to be overweight. Infrastructure end, we are underweight. Doesn't mean on the entire infra space, but only the roads and the airports. But if you look at the building materials and capital goods, there we are overweight. So this gives you a very good view, which ties in with the economy, the earnings, the upgrades, and the view, I think, pretty much uh, uh, plays itself out. Yeah, right? So if you see our various funds, the same order we have shown. So you can see that the green means we are overweight, and the red means we are underweight. Black means we are heavily underweight. So what I just explained is clearly here. Now, select focus fund or a balance fund, which is the old balance, equity hybrid, tax saver fund, mid cap, multiplier, smile, multiplier is now our larger mid cap fund. So, as you can see, that view pretty much is playing about in terms of the thought process, right? So, to summarize my presentation now, right, the outlook and the expectations, we believe that the disruption by the pandemic is well behind us. The large monetary fiscal system is working its way through. There is now certainty around the U.S. election with the Biden win. This is positive for trade and for continued global and monetary fiscal actions, which we believe are supportive for India. Activity in agriculture and rural India have remained strong and unaffected by the pandemic, aided by the common strong spending focus on rural India, improving the price realizations, increased MSP support, rising rural spends, and agri reforms add support to rural India. Right? RBI has been very good and preemptive and its liquidity engine clubbed with the resolution framework are set to greatly help the ongoing recovery. The government has also been redirecting its fiscal spends to push consumption on the ground, so the post-COVID normalization will be accelerated. And this itself is good enough to ease the stress built up in the banking system, we believe, right? So with India's infection curve clearly peaking, vaccine approval would work towards hedge any downside risk, right? Low corporate tax, low interest rates, sample liquidity, reclaiming of reforms, ease of doing business, tactical production link incentive schemes, and the China plus one shift will continue to get FDI coming into India. So emerging market Asia is set to attract a sizable part of global quantitative easing liquidity because COVID has been handled better in emerging markets. Debt ratios are now lower, crude prices are lower, and balance of payment is better. So from our portfolio strategy, we are positioning for a domestic growth recovery. We are increasing exposure to quality financials, consumer discretionary, building materials, and auto. And within financials, we have a bias towards well-run, large private banks and good quality NBFCs. And the global recovery, we believe, will play through agrochem, specialty chemicals, auto ancillaries, and IT, right? The conception related to IT is because we believe balance sheets are good, and there's a lot of potential for cost savings. And obviously, digital and cloud are going to be drivers, right? Defenses will continue to maintain, uh, like in FMCG, pharma, telecom, but in select stocks. And we have generally moved closer to sector neutral so that we can play the cap curve within a sector better, right? So this will be nibble footed around the key risk, which even in India still is the risk of a second wave as the economy opens up, right? So 
we look for a usual good and sustainable business and reasonably valued stock with a growth oriented focus so thank you very very much uh, dear friends i hope you enjoyed this session where like i said we focus more on the sectoral play in the stock market and we will try to build on this in future webinars uh, thank you very very much mutual fund investments are subject to market risks read all scheme related documents carefully